Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Glad you could all join us. The floor looks fantastic. Uh, I can't wait for it to get completely done and for the bathroom to be done. So uh, let's pray for that this week and then nothing out of the ordinary happens as soon as we get that done. But I'm glad to have you all here. Let's go to the Lord with our worship. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. What you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body. What you put in, put what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? That from the words of Jesus from the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 25 and 26. <laughs> okay. It's your ministry. Prayer request for today, first and foremost, for the people of Afghanistan. I just cannot imagine what they must be going through. Um, prayers for students, teachers, bus drivers, and support staff as they go back for in-person learning. Peggy's grandson and stepdaughter both have tested positive for COVID with very minor issues. Healing for Tabitha and her head congestion, whatever's going on. And Gary goes to the doctor tomorrow for healing with his issue. Anything else? Heavenly Father, we just we lift these prayers up to you, Lord. You know what each one of us needs. You know what all of us need. But you ask us to recognize our own needs and come to you and bring them to you. And that's what we do when we come together at this time. We bring all of our needs, not just to you, but to each other. Because you told us that where two or more are gathered, you are in our midst. And when we pray, and we pray in the name, name of Jesus, we know that you hear and will grant an answer to that prayer because that is what you promised us, Lord. So today we lift up the people in Afghanistan, especially those around the city of Kabul. Lord, there's so much going on over there and they need help, they need to be able to stand on their own, but there's so much more going against them. So we just ask for your strength in that area. We know there's not a whole lot of believers there, but if your hand could rest over them, build that hedge of protection against the forces that are coming against the, the peaceful people that are there, that would be a testimony to your strength and your sovereignty and the hope that you offer all of us through Jesus Christ. So we lift them up to you, Lord, that they will find and seek your guidance through all of this. Lord, we lift up our, our educators from the administrations all the way down to the, I shouldn't say down. It's, a, it's not a, a ladder, it's a line. But from our administrators to our custodians and our bus drivers and bus attendants, Lord, all of those people that make our kids learning a great opportunity for them. May you lift them up and protect them. May you give them the wisdom to teach what needs to be taught. To give them the truth of, of life and of history and of everything that goes on, Lord. And just be with them and, and be with the students, Lord, to keep them safe. As they come and go to school, they participate in the school day, the, the extracurriculars that they participate, everything that goes on with their education, Lord. We just ask that you... Put that hedge around them and keep them safe as well, both students and staff, Lord. And we lift up our friends who are in need of healing. Some of our friends have been already been diagnosed with COVID, some of them again. 
Lord, we just we lift them up to you that they can get through these days of, of discomfort with this. We pray that the, the symptoms that they get are minor and that they can push through it and look to you for that strength to get through that each day that they have to deal with it. Lord, and we just lift all of those up, not just our friends and family, but all people around the world that they would seek your guidance for their healing and not just from COVID, but from everything possible that's out there that they need help with. Lord, and we just lift those all up to you in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, as we lift our nation up, Lord, a nation that is lost, a nation that is stumbling something terrible right now. Lord, impress upon our leaders the, the need for you in this country, Lord, for your will and your, your ways. That's the only way that we know America will truly be great again is to fall back in line with what you have put forward for us, Lord. And we ask that our leaders return to you and begin to follow your leadership but also those of us here in the church, take what you have already given us and we go out and we express your love and your grace to all those in the world, Lord. And we lift them all up to you from our leadership, to our citizens, to our military, and all those who take care of us, Lord, that you keep them safe and give them the wisdom they need, Lord. And we lift them all up and we pray as Jesus taught us to pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this daily bread and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Good morning again. Good morning to those of you joining us online for today's lesson. It's good to have all of you here with us. We've made it through another week, and we're going to take a look at a verse that many of us know, many of us listed in one of our as one of our favorite verses. But do we really understand the verse? That's the question. So we're going to do a little coffee mug Christianity and break it down a little. We're going to talk about God's sovereign hope. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for bringing us together this morning. I lift up this congregation, those who are here, those who are watching us online, Lord, that everybody can learn something from your word, that our hearts and our minds are open to what your word has to say, Lord, and that you will give me the words that everyone needs to hear. And we pray this and we lift this up to you in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The trouble with life verses. Life verses, those are those verses that we, we take and we, we hold on to them with, with white, a white knuckle grip because they we, we like what they say about our lives. They, they, they tend to define our spiritual life and and where we stand with God. But there's a problem with life verses. We often, we take that verse, we just pull it out, and we say this verse is going to get me through anything. Um, you know, you've heard the, the phrase, or the, the, the uh, adage, don't not judge a book by its cover, right? Well, you can't take a verse and judge it just by those 10 or 15 words. Who here has seen Sound of Music? I mean, arguably one of the greatest musicals of our, of our time. Well, there's a character in there, Maria. And, and one of my favorite songs in that, is, in that movie is the, the one that the nuns sing in the very beginning of the, of the movie, or of the musical. It's, how do you solve a problem like, like Maria? How do you catch a cloud and pin it down? How do you find a word that means Maria? A flibberty gibbet? A willow in the wisp? A, cl 
power. They don't like Maria because she's full of life and vibrant and, and doesn't live, live that solemn nun life that we expect nuns to live. I'll tell you what, the church that I grew up in, none of the nuns were like the, the old nuns that were there. They were more like Maria. They led the youth group. They went, they took us out on outings. They played guitar for us. They held gatherings. Uh, there were three or four of them that were just fantastic. They were in Maria, all wrapped up together. It was great. But we're going to take a look. Our main verse today is a marvelous verse has a great purpose and value for, not just for, for Judah back when it was first spoken to them, but for us today as well. We have to be careful though, because its meaning may not be what we think it is. You see, Jeremiah 29, 11, it's a go-to verse for many people, especially believers in trying to Persuade or coax a non-believer into believing. Or when they're going through those tough times, we like to live out this verse and say, I, I have nothing to worry about because God has nothing but good in line for me. And when you read it, it's easy to understand. I mean, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil. To give you a future. Now, in the, in the English Standard Version, it, the word it, it uses is welfare. Other versions use prosperity. And don't get me wrong, God does promise good for us as believers, just not always in the way that we expect it to be. God never said, I'm going to make you rich when you believe. He never said, you're going to have an easy life when you put your faith in Christ. I mean, too many people take this verse at its face value. But you have to look at it and go, what is it that God is trying to communicate? Uh, we know God is a good God. He only wants us to get what is good for us. He wants us to live a good life. He wants to make sure we're healthy and, and able to do things and, and that. But we also have to ask in this verse, who is God talking to? Because he wasn't talking to you and I initially. You know, none of the scripture was initially at you and I. So who is it that he's talking to? In this case, he's talking to Judah, who happens to be in exile in Babylon. They've only been there a few years now. But that's who he's talking to. And then you have to ask yourself, okay, Judas, the audience, what was their state of mind? What were they going through? Well, they were in exile. They were away, forced out of their homeland. So what do you think was going through their mind? God, when are you going to bring me back to my home? I missed my other, the other half of my family that didn't get sent over here. I had a job there. I had a business. I've got nothing here. And you're going to make me stay here? And that's what we tend to, when we look at this verse, 20, 29, 11, we, we have that, we see that, all we see are the words, Plans for prosperity or welfare, not for evil. We kind of we become the nuns or even the Van Traps when they first met Maria. We see this, this lively, energetic young lady who doesn't seem to have a care in the world and does things differently than what we're used to. All of them, except for the mother superior. She seemed to know something the others didn't. 
Now, granted, she's the mother superior, so, you know, that's kind of like the, the priest in the Catholic Church. You know, that's a direct line to God that we, we seem to think priests and pastors seem to have that we don't. I'm sure that the Mother Superior did a great deal of praying for Maria. And this is what God dropped in her lap, was this opportunity to be a nanny. When we look, my, sorry about that, my slide is messed up, it's not what it's supposed to be. But when we look at a, a verse that takes some context, you have to look at how, did this, how does this verse fit into the whole story? I mean, you've got the, the chapter that it's in, the paragraph that it's in, the chapter that it's in, the book that it's in, which testament is it in? What type of book is it? How does it fit to the whole story? And when you take these verses out of context, there's a lot that can go wrong. And you take Jeremiah 29, 11, and you say, oh, God promises my prosperity, and nothing bad's going to happen to me. Well, kind of, but not completely. Context presides us with the details of this event, this, this part of the story, this, this part of how God needs us to understand what he is doing. And without it, we only get part of the meeting. We don't get the whole thing. So we're standing on the, out there and we're going, okay, I've got this verse, and I've got this one word in the verse, and the Lord said this, and... You know, it's you're kind of sitting out there like uh, Wiley e. Coyote when he was chasing Roadrunner, and you've got the saw over here waiting for you know when you're out on the end of the branch. You may just cut yourself off. And when we don't have the whole story, human beings have this really bad thing that they do when they don't know the whole thing. We like to fill in the gaps with what we want it to be. Good, bad, or indifferent. We like to fill it in the way we think it is supposed to say it. So when you read Jeremiah 29, 11, it's easy to see why they flock to this prosperity ideology that some have. And some of us have lived hard lives. And the last year, last year and a half hasn't haven't helped us any. And while 2021 looked like it was going to get better, the further we move away from 2020 and the pandemic, it seems like we're getting closer to it. You know, you can't write history based on one year or one decade. You know, 2020 is, was a bad year for many of us, for almost all of us. But it's one little moment in time in our lives. My life is not over because of COVID. You know, a business owner... Their life is not over because they ended up having to shut the doors because of the restrictions that were put on. It may feel that way, but it's not the end. It's just one moment. And like I said, you can't write history just based on 2020. And not much, that'd be a disaster to say, well, the whole world is just done because 2020 came along. You know, you look at look at the history of mankind, the accomplishments that we have that you would leave out if you talk only about 2020. Going to the moon. Wouldn't learn about that. Discovering how to battle these viruses and bacteria. 
with vaccines and hygiene and all of that. Moving from foot travel to animal carts to cars, planes. I think you get the idea. There's more to history than just one year, than just one little blip on the clock. Likewise, you can't take a verse out of Scripture without looking at the verses around it, both before and after. So let's take a look at what God's plan is to make his children prosper and have a hope for the future. Jeremiah 29, starting in verse 4. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Right off the bat, you know, when you read when you read history, people like to say, well, this country pulled us out of ours and put us in exile. Right here, God's telling Judah, Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar had nothing to do with it. I did this. Verse 5, build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there. Do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into this exile. And pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you and do not listen to the dreams that they dream. For it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. For thus says the Lord, when the 70 years are completed, for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I knew the plans, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. It's Jeremiah 29, 4 through 14. Every time I've sat on a class, in a class on leadership or self-improvement, every instructor I've ever had has you do two things. By the end, by the end of that workshop, you're doing, you're, you're determining what are my short-term goals and what are my long-term goals. That's kind of what God is doing here in Jeremiah. He's telling Israel, "These are my short and long-term goals for you." The young man behind me, his name is Dan Frost. He played forward for the University of Iowa. Like most athletes, and especially those at D1 schools, had aspirations of playing and receiving a lucrative NBA contract. Well, that didn't pan out. But Dan never lost sight on his goal of being successful. He never lost sight of who he was in God's eyes. And he rested on the truth of Jeremiah 29 11. That says, God is in control. Even when I'm not. Or, excuse me. That God is in control even when I'm not aware that he's in control. You know, we look at things and things happen and we go, why? What is going on? Why, God, is this stuff happening to me? 
Israel or Judah did that in Babylon. Why are we here? So God came through Jeremiah and said, okay, this is what's going to happen. We've got some short-term things and we've got some long-term things for you. Now keep in mind, Jeremiah is coming out with this after a prophet named Hananiah said, not to worry, God's going to send us back in two years. It's not going to be a problem. We're not going to be here very long. Don't worry about it. And Jeremiah comes along and says, eh, no, Hananiah is lying to you and don't listen to him. God has already cursed him. He's going to be dead in a couple of months. And he was. But the message from Jeremiah came out and said, you're going to have to stay here a little while. 70 years to be exact. And, you know, that's going to require some suffering on your part. You're going to have to work a little bit harder than if you were back at home in Israel running your life the way it was. You know, we all like short-term problems. No way out. It comes, it happens, and it goes. We can move on. From it. We don't have to worry about it. You know, Judah, no different. They love the fact that Hananiah said, all right, two years, let's go. Jeremiah, who had been prophesying for years with them, said, eh, not so fast. But if you stay here, do what God tells you to do, and remember that God brought you here because of your own disobedience, that had nothing to do with Babylon and what Babylon's doing, the fact that Babylon doesn't believe in God. I, God removed you from your comfortable, cushy lives. And that same God is the one who's in control. He sent you here for your, because of your own treachery, not the treachery of another nation. He used that nation, but he did this. But he did this to draw us back to him. Verses 5 and 6 make it clear that they're going to have to stay. Build houses, live in them, plant your gardens, get married, marry off your kids, have more children. Don't let yourself decrease while you're here. God's short-term plan was to bring about Judah's welfare or prosperity Right there in Babylon. These verses tell them to make their own lives. And then he comes along with verse 7. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. And pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare you find yours. So God's saying, okay, you're going to stay here, build your lives, and then smack. You need to make sure their lives are taken care of. You need to make sure that they are blessed through you by me. See, that word welfare that he used about in, in verse 11 about the believers is the same word that he uses here in verse 7 that says to pray uh, to seek the welfare of the city or the nation of Babylon. That word is this word. Shalom. I would imagine if I did a survey of those of us here this morning, most of us would come out and say, oh yeah, Shalom. Peace. Hi. Goodbye. But it's, it means so much more than that. Like most ancient languages, it's got a very broad meaning, much more than just peace. See, it comes from a primitive root word that means to be safe and to be friendly. Make amends. Restitution. Provide a reward. Its own meaning, be safe. 
expect welfare, peace. Essentially, what God is trying to tell Judah is, if you expect me to bring you back home and make you succeed, you have to provide this shalom, this welfare, this restitution. You have to give this peace to Babylon, to your captors. I don't want you living in rebellion against them. You must help them to prosper alongside of you. God's calling them to do this because it's, it's his will. It's, it's bringing Judah back in line. In doing it, you will also find blessing amongst yourselves. You will have your family. You will have your, your prosperity. You'll be blessed while you are here. But it's also an allusion to the future. When you do what God is doing, when you do what God wants you to do, this is what's going to happen. For us, it's following Jesus' word, words, following him and his teaching. See, in verse 11, he's essentially telling, hey, don't sweat it. All right, I just told you, yeah, you're going to be here 70 years. But I've got this. Follow me. Do what I tell you to do. Provide that that welfare, that peace, that prosperity for Babylon, and you will find it as well. And if you think about it, what he's telling them is, all right, yeah, you had your business there. Build that business back up. You've got a whole new world to sell to right now. God doesn't just go, bing, you're rich. He says, this is your gift, running this business, providing this service, making this fabric, sewing clothes, farming, whatever it may be, that will provide you with prosperity and riches. Now, God never intended for us to suffer. And when you follow his words, when you follow his instructions, there will come a day when you will be elevated to heights that no other nation will know. But there's a process to that. And you have to trust the process. How many of you ever heard that one from a coach or a mentor? There's a way of doing it. Trust that way. Yeah, it's going to be tedious. You're going to get... You're going to bust your knuckles along the way. You might even get hurt. But in the end, you'll have something far greater. You see, God's plan is to save everyone. To save all. All who believe and follow His Son, Jesus Christ. He is going to raise them up in glory alongside Jesus. He's going to keep them from death. That's what Jesus promises us. When you follow me and do what I tell you to do, when you teach what I taught and make disciples of the Lord, you will have everlasting life. Talk about a hope for a future. I don't have to die. I'm sure my body's going to, but I don't have to. I will live forever. So we're called to make the best of what we have. To be content, as Paul called it. In his letter to the Philippians, he said this, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to be brought, how to abound in any and every circumstance. 
I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. There's another one of those, those life verses that we hold on to. No matter what's going on in your life, trust the process. Know that God is in control. And when we hand our lives over and say, okay, God, I don't like being here, but bring me through. That's what Paul did. You know, Paul talked about that thorn in his side. Do you think he liked that? Poke, you know, I mean, think about it. I mean, a thorn poking you the whole time, the whole, everything you do, having that, that one thing that just, you know, it's like going for a hike and having a stone in your shoe and not being able to get it out. It didn't matter to him if he was living in abundance or poverty because he trusted the process. And he knew that if he did that, God, he would be able to accomplish everything God put before him because it was through God, through Jesus and the Holy Spirit that he was given the power to be able to do that and the ability. He did what God called on Judah to do in Babylon, provide for the welfare of all, even those who seem to be in opposition. So we have to be content with where we're at. Not always the best thing in the world. It's not always the most fun thing. But when we're content and we follow God, we have this little thing, resilience. Hear that term a lot. You know, stay the course. You can get through this. Be resilient. Stand up. You get knocked down, stand back up again. Put your boots back on. Jump back up, up on that horse. The whole context around Jeremiah 29, 11 provides us with the purpose and meaning of the 27 words in that verse. God's plan is being worked out in our lives, regardless of how you or I perceive it. It is all good and good for us. Our personal redemption in God comes through our resilience in following his plan and playing out, using the process. Whether it's mundane and dragging us through the mud or speedy and energetic and we're on top of the world. Think about it this way. Precious metals and stones just simply appear although it seems that way anymore. Even synthetic diamonds require a minimum of six weeks to be made. But they also require a temperature of around 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. You know, the last couple of months, the, the, the average has been around 95, it feels like about 110. That's 500 times less than what it takes to make a diamond. 5,000 degrees and 725,500 pounds per square inch of pressure. 725,000 pounds. Think you could handle that? Our life is pretty simple. Artificial rubies are 4,352 degrees. Jade's 3,812 degrees. Heck, even metal, or excuse me, gold, to get 99.9999% pure gold requires it to go through a smelting process where it's melted down at almost 2,000 degrees. And metals that are now become more precious than gold are even higher than that, more than twice that. That's what God does with his children, refining each of us to purify us, to redeem us, 
to clean us. Going through these trials isn't easy. It was never intended to be easy. But it separates us from the impurities. And to do that, it requires the heat and pressure to burn off what isn't supposed to be there. The same thing we do when we make precious stones and metals. Resilience is making it through the process and it leads to redemption and the future hope of an eternal life with God. And it may not be in our lifetime, which isn't necessarily a bad thing because our bodies die and we go on to be with God. You've been redeemed. <coughs> Seventy years was a long time back then. Today it's not so long. But we're in that similar situation that Judah was in. We haven't been removed from our country, but in many ways as believers, we have seen our country taken away from us. The church today fights for its spiritual life against those who have placed us in exile, telling us we can only have, we can only do church in the four walls of our building. We can't do it on the public square. As time passes, we lose more and more of our rights to practice our faith. While we can blame others, the truth is the church has no one to blame but itself. It doesn't matter what time period you look at. Church leaders in the church have often clamped on to some of these so-called light verses and used them as a hammer on the heads of those they're trying to reach rather than using them as a brush and applying gentle strokes. With each passing day, immature believers are falling, falling prey to what ministers are they're falling prey to what ministers use to take advantage of their ignorance. Using verses like Jeremiah 29, 11, to coerce people into believing that all you have to do is say, I'm a child, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, and I'm going to be rich beyond measure. They fail to understand their blessing is found not today, but in the future. A hope of eternal life in heaven because of the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made. It's not about prosperity and riches on earth. What is your legacy going to be? Is your spiritual life teaching prosperity through faith? Or are you living out, living for the Lord and offering shalom, peace, welfare, restitution for those who have put us in exile? A Christian legacy should reflect the image of God today. You don't know when you're going to be called to relinquish this life. None of us knows that. But one day we will get to see the blessing that God talks about in Jeremiah 29. That future prosperity and welfare when we are in heaven with him. When we are dining at the table, the wedding supper of the Lamb. God does promise prosper prosperity for us, but it doesn't mean we'll be rich here. At least not in the terms of man, but in the terms of God. Life verses aren't always what we think they are. If you have one, Great. But I encourage you to look at the, the context of it. Read the whole paragraph. The paragraphs before and after the chapter. Check out reference verses if your Bible has those. 
If you don't have a Bible that shows them, there are a great number of Bibles online that you can get those from. Look things up in a Bible dictionary. Again, great resources online for that. Great commentaries that you can find online. But we need to know and understand the verse we choose to exemplify our life. Especially when we want others to follow in our footsteps. Jeremiah 29 11. God promises to make sure we have all that is good. But we need to remember it's not a promise of riches or a promise of an easy life just because you say, I follow Christ. Each of us will be rewarded with that, that shalom, peace, and prosperity. Not necessarily in this lifetime. Our true shalom is delivered, is not to be delivered until we are in heaven with Jesus and with God. Heavenly Father, we, we sit here, we, we lift ourselves up to you, and we know that you are providing for us a life that is beyond anything we could ever imagine. We just ask for that strength to live out your will for us, to proclaim your good news, to provide that shalom, that prosperity and welfare for those around us. Just strengthen us, Lord, and give us the words and the ability to provide that, even to those who seem like an end. And we offer ourselves in prayer to you through our Savior, your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. I hope you all have a blessed week. Take advantage of the opportunity to study those verses and like to base your life.